Welcome to Camera Shake Podcast, episode 90. That's 10 away from 100. Good counting, well done. The podcast where we talk about photography, videography, and anything that's got anything to do with any of that with me, Kirsten Lutz, and Nick Kirby, and our special guest today, the German Christmas Stollen. Stollen. Stollen, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's klar. Mm. <laughs> I feel I feel the Stollen speaks to me. Well, <laughs> in my native tongue. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> What, Canadian? <laughs> <laughs> German. <laughs> you know. Don't you know, yeah. Oh, dear. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm eating, eating up all the crumbs already because I love this stuff. It's lovely. Yeah. But it's, it's good, isn't it? Mm. Once you get started on this, mm -hmm. there's no way out. There's nothing of this going to be left. Yes, yeah, so we're a couple of weeks late with this, but I only just found mm. it. I found it in the pantry. How? I don't know. I didn't know. I, well, I sort of forgotten that we had it. Ah, oh, there we go. Otherwise, so it, you know, it would have come out. Yeah. <laughs> over Christmas, oh, yeah. But. Well, you know, on the plus side, we've got it for today. Luckily for us, mm -hmm. we have it today. There you go. It's not like it goes off anytime soon. Yeah. So I want to start this week's episode with a bit of a controversy. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So I've been listening, as I always do in the car, um, to some of my favorite podcasts. And uh, and then I listened to one of the podcasts, um, another photography podcast that I listen to quite regularly called Photobomb. And of course, uh, we had our dear friends, Bure Perry and... Um, and uh, Gary used on the show in the past. The link shall be up there or up there. Not sure. Somewhere up there. Um, but so I overheard them talking about cover songs and the fact that you should always, always, always play a cover song. If you cover a song, you should always play it exactly 100% as it is on the record forevermore, like a tribute band. Now, that, that sounds like a... Wait, who said this? Do you remember? I think they're both in the agreement. Really? Both in agreement, yes. So, you know. That surprises me. <laughs> Do they play in bands? Uh, Gary's a guitarist, yeah. I know, they, sure. I know they play, but mm. are they actually in, in a band? I have no idea. It doesn't sound like that. Oh, uh, well, I'll find out. I'll find out. <laughs> but so the thing, the thing is, you know, I, I thought about this, and this is like, it's one of the things that I actually teach when I teach bands, or I have taught when I've taught bands in, in, the, in the past. And, and so... I thought, who better to ask than you, seeing that you play in a, you know, professional mm. functions band. Mm. Like, how do you approach that on that level when you decide to cover a track? Um, well, it's, there's, because I've been doing it for so long, or, or we have been doing it for so long, you don't really think about it anymore. Mm. You just do what you think sounds good. And what I mean by that is, um, it needs to sound like the original. It needs to sound like a live version of the original mm. done by the original artist. It needs to include elements of perhaps things that people have covered before that make it sound good. If you've ever listened to a band play as one of their tracks live, other than anything that's come out in the last 10, 15 years, because that's just, it's identical live as, it, as mm. it is on the record. But any rock style, rock genre band, it's never the same. There's always little additions in there, things that the guitarist wanted to do that they couldn't sure. do on the record. The producer decided no, or he's come up with it since because the song's bedded in more. Because half the time they write these songs in the studio as they're recording them, things change. Hmm. They add little sections, extend little bits here and there, add something to make it a little more interesting, a little more fun. Yeah, guitar solos are a good example because, you mm. know, some, I mean, obviously, very often, the solos are written and they're pretty much set in stone, especially when they're iconic solos. Mm. Um, and then, you know, you would sort of expect to hear that solo played as is. Absolutely. You know, when you go You're and see the You're the main riff as it was. Yeah. But more often than not, you know, a lot of these a lot of these solos are improvised in the studio. And so mm -hmm. as a consequence, life, they're always going to be a little bit different, you know, because, because that's just the part for the guitarist to let rip, basically. Yeah. But here's the thing, you know, and I'm not saying... I'm not saying Gary and Bure are wrong. Sounded sounded like you just did. <laughs> no, they're different <laughs> different opinions, of course. I get it. But I always, you know, my opinion's always been. I mean, yes, there is a lot to be said for covering a track and making it sound 100 percent a citizen of record. It's difficult, actually. It it's really difficult to do. But the other way, the other approach is to take a song and to really change it dramatically. So you really hit it out of the ballpark. Like, for example, you could take, like, Nirvana's Nevermind, for example. Smells Like Teen Spirit. 
right? Take Smells Like Teen Spirit and turn that into a trad jazz version. Right. Or so, a bluegrass version. Or I do something. have thoughts on all of this. Right, okay. So I'm absolutely all right with someone covering a song and playing it note for note perfect, sound for sound perfect, mm. tempo for tempo perfect. All, all for that. Absolutely no issue with that in the slightest. And actually, there are times in my group that we do exactly that because it's the right thing to do for that particular song mm. and actually change it in the way we would typically change a song to be a bit more rocked up, a bit more energy in life, a bit more modern. Every Phil Collins track falls yeah, into that category. Exactly. Um, it's not always appropriate. True. And that's fine. You've got to do what's appropriate. I don't mind those tracks which are done in the way you just described. I just don't like them. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. I just don't have an issue with it. I just uh-huh. don't like them. I, I do like songs to be close to the original, but, and to go, oh, yeah, it's a cracking version of, just for argument's sake, Mr. Brightside. Right. Just for argument's sake. Yeah. Because it's just, it's got more energy and more life and a bit more interest to it than the original had. Mm. And if you've ever heard them, the Killers play it live, they're not a live band. Oh no, <laughs> they're mm. not the best, um, particularly vocally. It's surprising. Just, uh. Yeah, they're not great. They're not great. Some parts are good, but they've got better as the years have gone on. But I've seen so many performances where it's like, what? Are you, what are you doing? What is it? That's timing, is it? Is, it, is that the benefit? That's pitch, is it? Is that the benefit of um, you know? Changing things in the studio. Maybe. Right. See, and well, this is the other thing. I'm an engineer as well, so I, yeah. I know exactly what happens. Uh, and you've you've done tons of session work, right? Mm. So it's you, we know exactly what goes on in the studio and how things work. And, yeah, for sure. 100%, you know, yeah. how, how, many, how many solos have you done in a session where one, one solo was what was actually used? Or was it a combination of multiple different takes that you did? Um. I mean, the vast majority are composited, if you want to call it that, yeah. cut together. Yeah, for sure. Comped, yeah. No, yeah. I mean that's you know that's that's normal. Um, a lot of the times, a lot of the times, it's really a, you know, a matter of unless the song is written, that's a whole different yes, thing. True, but a lot of the times, it's a matter of you know the engineer just <laughs> looping the eight bars of the solo section, you know, and you basically hit it. That's it. You know, exactly right. You, you essentially play and you jam and you record, you know, five minutes or something of it. Yeah. And then, you know, somebody goes and, and cuts the best bits together. You know, that's mm-hmm. that's very often how it works. Um, the, you know, I think the better you get at doing that, you know, the better the stuff is that you can deliver. So it doesn't have to be five minutes. It could be like 30 seconds. You know? Absolutely. And you run through Absolutely. it twice, three times and, you know, it's done or whatever. I mean, that's, you know, that's the and thing. You'll, you'll get guidance from whoever's producing the track as to the style, the type of thing that they're expecting yeah. to hear. And so then you, you, you're the one who's there to deliver that kind yeah, of direction, I, right? Yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, that's, that's what a producer does. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, if the producer will tell you like, you know, can you make it sound like that? I mean, often the thing to remember, I think this is, this is really one of the, I think the main core skills for any session musician out there, because it's not, I mean, of course it's about being able to play well and, you know, not costing anybody more time and money than necessary. Um, but it's also very often a matter of being able to translate what the producer tells you Good because, word. you know, producers are not guitar players necessarily, or very mm-hmm. often they're not, you know, their main instrument might be piano or but whatever, right. Uh, it might be singer or something. And so the way, and they're often, I mean, again, in the, in the pop world, in the rock world, they're very often not trained musicians. So they don't yep. necessarily have the vocabulary necessarily to can, communicate. Can you make it more gritty? Can you make it more fluid? Yeah, can, can you make you, it more pokey? Yeah, good, I mean, a good, good <laughs> example would be like, you know, uh, you know, can you get me that brown sound? I'm like, what the hell is a brown sound? It's not the, the famous Van Halen brown sound. It's like whatever, you know, you sort of, you try to translate that. If you need into, to go to the bathroom, you just let me know. <laughs> make it sound like shit. So. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, one, one producer I used to work with quite a lot, actually. I remember he used to say to me, um, can you put some country guitar on there? And when he said country guitar, I knew that what he meant was steel string acoustic. Mm. So, and usually what he meant was just strum some of the chords, right? You know, and record a, a rhythm track like that. But that was the thing. Like that was, you know, you'd just be able to translate what they're trying to tell you yeah. Yeah. into, you know, into 
what they're hearing in their head, yeah. basically. And this applies to any any client that you work with in any creative kind of world, whether it's photo, video, or or music. Yeah. And, you know, whoever's the client or the producer in this particular instance. Yeah they may not be able to communicate with you because they don't use the terminology that you you might and you've got to yeah. understand it and, and like it, you said translate yeah and the beautiful thing about you know about working as a team i think um you know very often i can we, we can take the stuff that we do together very often you know um in in the world of photography and video um it's the better you know the other person hmm. the easier it is to a interpret what they're saying but also to kind of almost like know in advance, to have that instinct in knowing what kind of vision yep. the other person has, you know, that's and that's, you know, that is, that comes through experience. And, you know, and of course, I mean, again, in, in the music world, the more often you work with the same producer, the more yeah. you know what they're looking for. Same in performance yeah. as well. If you're, because uh, I'm a bass player, I'm, you know, the, the drummer is one of the most important people in the band for me hmm. um, because we need to lock we need to be doing the same things at the same time. And we don't always know what we're going to maybe be doing in mm. that particular song. We're going to change it. If I hear, when you know a drummer, I can I, I know what type of fill he's going to play or sometimes before he's going to do it and when he's going to do it mm. and vice versa. So I know yeah. I need to be doing something along those lines when it comes to that, the next couple of bars, yeah. whatever it is, because I know him so well. I know how he plays and I know what he's going to do. Yeah. It's just exactly the same principles. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, we, we find that a lot, I think, when we're working together on on a particular project that, you know, whilst, for instance, whilst you're busy, I don't know, setting up a camera, if it's a video product, for example, then, you know, no no words need to be spoken. <coughs> you know, I already yeah. know what else needs doing and I'll just get on and do it without, without the needing to be any so first degree communication yeah. necessarily. That's so it. it's, you know, that, um, that's how that works. But... You know, to come back to my point, I always, you know, I always thought that taking a song and completely changing it, maybe just changing the genre, the tempo, like really taking that basic song material and changing it um, to something completely different, there's sort of a creative art in doing that. And there, there is. You know, and I find that, uh, I just find it fascinating very often. It, it's quite easy to do, but it's very difficult to make it any good. It's well, very it's, difficult yeah. to make it any good. There's, um... There's a bluegrass band. Was it a Hazy Dixies or something? I can't remember. But um, yeah, this rings a bell. Actually. Yeah, they did. Yeah. Uh, I think they did. Like, yeah. did they do something like you know the entire Black Album by Metallica and Bluegrass or something? Was it them? Yeah, something like that. I forget now. Yeah, there's a few bits like that out there. It's quite good. Anyway, yeah, there we so go. while some stuff in my face was stolen, gobble gobble. Hmm? What I'm what I'm trying to say is, so for those on audio, he's just pointing at the moment. I'm not going to say anything. I'm just going to let him go <laughs> yeah, until it's I'm finished. Trying to try to this. <laughs> anyway, so what I'm trying to say is it's not that anybody's wrong here. It's just that some people are more right than others. <laughs> and on that bombshell, <laughs> on that we bombshell. shall move on to new topics. <laughs> and if you are listening, <laughs> if you are that one or two listeners in Florida, <laughs> then, you know, get in touch. And let's see what you, let us know what you think. Anyway, um, so... Talking about projects, we've just spent the weekend working on an interesting one. Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, in the freezing cold. Yeah, and strangely related to music again. Yeah, go figure. No, it's, like, well. it's like we have we do stuff around music. Every <laughs> exactly. Time. Yeah, so no, it was good fun. That it was good fun. So the thing was, we um, well, we were working on some band photos for a band for a local band, and. Um, we had a really cool location. So the location was um, a motor, motorcycle workshop mm. um, that was owned by a, a guy who's like a, a Harley Davidson and British motorcycle expert sort of a thing. And it's this really cool workshop that's like, you know, a little bit greasy, very gritty, but it has some real cool gems of like custom bikes in there and all the rest of it. So really Actually, a cool location to show. Had to a do great a look about it, didn't it? Great smell, too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oil. Yeah. Superb. No, it had a great look to it. Absolutely fantastic look to it. And so the idea, right, was uh, so this was a, a band shoot, but the idea was to not make it look like a band as yeah. such. I mean, 
it's always going to look like a band. There's no getting away from that when it's... There's five guys in the picture. It's not going to be the Chip and Nails. It's going to be a band, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Oh, God. See, oh, no. See, you were in the photo as well. And now I've got you as a Chip and Dale (laughs) in my head. Oh, my God. (laughs) Yeah, so that that was the other difficulty because I was actually in the photo too. Oh, Um, dear God. So that made it, you know, made it special. But, um, yeah, the, the idea was really to really approach it like an environmental portrait, really. Yeah. Um. Which is really what the fun was, you know, and then to make it very subtle, um, the fact that it was it was a band to the photo. Yeah. Yeah. So there were uh three shots all in all. Yeah, so we did three setups. Um and it was one of them, wasn't it, that had instruments dotted around the photo. Yes, but it was sort of hidden and yeah. blended it with the background. So the idea was really to, you know, you have to look really, really hard if you want to find any musical, you know, links there or instruments yeah. or something. Um, it was really, really about the location, about the motorbike stuff and everything. Um, and, you know, the, I, I think for me, bigger shoots like that, <coughs> which, uh, you know, which require <laughs> lots of gear and lots of hands on deck and assistance and all the rest of it, the fun... Uh, for me, is that, you know, you have this planning stage and then, of course, you've got the execution part and the post-production. And when it all comes together at the end, you know, when it comes together in the way that you had imagined it at the beginning, that's really where where the, the, the fun, for me, is. It's the process of this, you know, the whole thing. Yeah, and you, it's funny, isn't it? How many jobs you do like that that don't always come out exactly how you envisaged. Sure. But it's almost um, it's, it's almost shocking to a certain extent when it does come out exactly how you pictured, or better, you know, or better, yeah, or better, yeah, because um, it's normal, you know, you know. I say that in a way that it's per, you know, it is actually perfectly normal for the final result to be slightly different to yeah. what you may have imagined going into the shoot when you're planning to begin with, because mm. things just change on the day. You know, you may not have had as much chance to do a recce around the place and understand what's going on. Yeah. The time of day that you were there may have been ever so slightly different and whatever it might be. Well, the weather was a factor in this weather one. weather was a factor. Especially for the, for the first setup. So the idea was really, you know, we did three setups. One um, outside the workshop, you know, shooting in, which basically meant that the camera to be set up out, outside. And it was very weather dependent, this one, um, because had it rained, we would have basically dropped that first setup and moved on straight to the second setup, which would have been yeah. inside yeah. the workshop. And then the third setup was um, just of a straight up, you know, band portrait, basically. Yeah. Um, so, but as as luck would have it, the weather was actually really good on Sunday, and it was. I mean, it was maybe a little too sunny. It was too good. <laughs> yeah, it was too good. That's right. <laughs> Clear blue sky and sun is the one thing you virtually never get in this yeah. country happened on Sunday morning. And, um, and so it actually meant we had to flag out the sun, you know, and, um, and all the rest of it. So it's, which actually fell over at one point, didn't it? Cause these, one of the sandbags had got moved or, or something like That's that. That's the wind picked up. Yeah. Oh wait, no, this was a softbox that came down, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. 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 That's funny. Yeah. It, the wind picked up as well. So that was a, that was another thing. Luckily yeah. nobody got hurt. Yeah. Health and safety on set. And we finished that part of the shoot anyway. So yeah. yeah. And everything, nothing got broken, so it's all good. No, but it missed it missed me actually by like hair, you know. Yeah, and you've got a lot of hair. Yeah, so, <laughs> so um, <laughs> but you know, the whole fun, the whole fun there is that you know you always come up against problems on the set like that, and the fun part is overcoming those problems mm. there and then, um, because no matter how much you pre-plan in advance, you can't really take all the eventualities into consideration Absolutely. or into account. And then that's where experience kicks in a little bit. That's right, isn't it? The more you've done it, the more different little issues yeah. you've come across, the quicker you're going to be able to solve it there yeah. and then. And that's what you want, in particularly when you're in front of a client, right? Yeah. It's Exactly. You know, a pro- they, clients aren't, aren't stupid. They know problems are going to happen. You know, it's your job to you know, uh, course correct or fix or whatever yeah. it might be as quickly as you can. And yeah. hopefully without the client even knowing. So there's no added pressure on them. And it's also, you know, the added part of managing your client's expectations. That's mm. the other thing. So, you know, yeah. if you, for instance, in, in, in this case, we staggered the arrival times 
for example, although that didn't work because everybody wanted to be there right from the start, so everybody just showed up. <laughs> no, <laughs> never mind. <laughs> but the you know the, the thing was, we knew that there was going to be a lot of hanging around for people, yeah. especially for the talent as it were, because there was a lot of setup and there were a lot. Of, there was a lot of gear and a lot of moving parts um, that we had to check out first. Um, so, you know, once I think when you manage your clients' expectations and you make them understand that that's how it's going to be in order to get the result that they want, then everybody's on the same page and everybody knows yeah. what to expect, you know. Um, otherwise, tempers can get impatient and yeah. things like that. And, and those so. guys were good as gold in that respect, right? Absolutely. They were insanely patient. Yeah. Um, that, that being said, as shoots go, it went smooth as anything and quick. Yeah, and too. we also we had, a, we had a new assistant. Mm. on set as well which was super helpful Guara really helpful came down to uh, to help us and brought his own harley everybody has a harley around here what's going on and there's me can't <laughs> stand actually no it's a lie i i love looking at bikes i love the design i love how, everything about them the push bikes yeah. but yeah but will i, I will never get on one really okay. no 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 not for me no. at all not for me i just drive fast cars instead <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> Well, I mean, it, I mean, it, it was very impressive. I mean, not only the, we had a heart with, well, no, we had, when I mean, there were four Harleys right there, yeah. um, there was a Triumph, a triumph yeah. and then there were more custom bikes and stuff in, yeah. the, in the front of the shop. Yeah. So, it, you know, it was, <coughs> um, it, it was rather <coughs> impressive. And, uh, you know, I can, I mean, I don't know, maybe it's a midlife crisis type of a thing, mm. but I can, I can imagine riding a bike, no problem. Absolutely. I wouldn't really... I mean, I'm not even that fast a driver. I wouldn't really, although, you know. Well, do, do, you, do you really want to get onto that? Yeah, I got another speeding ticket. There you go. But anyway. Um, he only wanted his wife to take the points. Yeah, I'm joking, so, joking. That never happened. I mean, I, I don't know how you can even call that speeding. It's like 34 in a 30 zone. So it's not even really speeding. It's 30 for a reason, Kay. What? Yes. <laughs> there were no children or school children around. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, different story. Um, you know, I mean, the whole... The ambience there was cool. Mm. You know, the location was cool. The bikes really worked out. Um, and uh, and the end result, especially for the main shot that we'll, you know, that we'll talk about a little bit, um, actually, yeah, it turned out the way I had anticipated it turning out, although we ended, we ended up shooting it slightly differently from the way I had kind of planned on shooting it. Mm. Yeah. So yeah. we'll put the main shot up now. So what's happening in here is that we essentially have three parts to the image. Um, we have the two riders on the side, on the left and right. Riders on the storm. That's where the drum groove comes in. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we've got two riders on the on the side of the, the the main entrance to the workshop, and then of course we've got the characters inside. Mm -hmm. Um, so fixing or you know huddling around fixing a bike. Um, this really originally I had planned on doing all that in one shot. Yeah, but we ran into some problems lighting the interior of that workshop because it was just really narrow. It's like a long tube, you know. It was like it's narrow and it's it difficult. Was wasn't it? it was so bright outside and so dark yeah. inside and so, it just got darker and darker exactly so the back, contrast was just you know too much it was way too much so we had like a really bright sunny day out and um and really not a lot not a lot of light getting into the into the version we yeah. tried lots of different things this is the thing you know you've got to sometimes you just got to experiment a little bit um well that was the thing wasn't it we took some time to set up a few lights inside as well yeah. um where i mean it was very narrow in there so there's only yeah. so much you can do to keep them out of shot and you know, there's you can only spend so long doing that, and just know in yourself that you know what we could spend another hour and still not get this working. Yeah, time to change tact. Yeah, I mean we'd build in some extra time because we knew this yeah. was going to be a tricky yeah. shot um, generally. But um, you know, I think we're getting to the point where we had to make some decisions. We tried out different setups for this one, um, and nothing wasn't really working well enough. We could have done it in one shot. No, mm -hmm. you know, but it wouldn't have it wouldn't have been quite as, you know, as good as, as I'd imagine it to be. So, we in the end, I decided let's just just do it as a composite. Mm -hmm. And so, what we actually have is like three images that are composited together here. We've got 
the two writers on the side are actually from different takes. So, um, so those are two images, and the third image is really just the interior yeah. um, of the workshop. So we shot the exterior basically with softboxes, and the interior we just shot um, with a little nine-inch reflector that you and you were booming in the light. That was heavy. <laughs> that was heavy. That was very heavy. Um, and then I forget were there any other speed lights on the inside other than at the back. So we're just gelling it back on this one. Yeah, it was yeah. just it was just a couple of gels, weren't there? There was no other ungelled no. speed light in there. No, was right it? Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. So we basically had, I mean, all in. You know, if you count, if you count all three setups in this, and you know, all in are five lights, I think, at work. No, yeah. six. Sorry, six lights. Yeah. You know, three back lights. Uh, three um, speed lights. One, two, lighting three, the four, background. It's got three in the back and then two softbox on the outside yeah. and then you booming the... I'll tell you what really d- did make a difference was actually turning those fluorescent lights on in the end. Not to give light, sure, because they didn't yeah. and they're obviously awful. But it really adds, for me, it adds a lot of depth to that room that you yeah. wouldn't have got otherwise. Yeah, the ceiling was a really tricky ceiling in there mm. um, because it was... So on the piss as well, isn't it? Well, yeah, so it's low and on the piss in British English basically means it wasn't straight. (laughs) I'd forgotten about that, yeah. (laughs) So, um, yeah, so the ceiling wasn't actually straight at all. Um, You could could actually see it in the image. Um, So it's slanting slightly to one side. But um, but it was also, you know, like beams coming across and it was like cables, whatever. So um, so these, these ceiling lights actually did add something to it. Absolutely. Um, and seeing that we were booming in the key light anyway, it might, but it didn't have any impact on like color temperature or anything. Like oh, that. Totally. So, yeah. You know, um, I forgot to ask yesterday, did you, uh, how did you replace the sky? Was that, um, did you manually do like, did you use Photoshop sky replacement? Oh, Photoshop sky replacement. Yeah. yeah. And it worked, did it work all right? Very well. Yeah. Oh, good. It's definitely, but since Photoshop introduced that maybe like a year ago or something, it has gotten better. It's got even better. Isn't yeah, it? The yeah. I haven't was... used it much lately. So it's where it's gotten better is uh, when you have things like antennas or something ah. on rooftops because it used to cut out a little bit of the you know um, sure. the, the rods or something but it's gotten yeah it's gotten a lot more precise. Mm. Uh, you can of course always go back because you save it as a separate layer so you can always go back in yeah. and manually uh, you know fix this. But actually this was pretty much pretty much like a one shot sort of thing. Good good. Um, yeah no no problem at all. Um, was there any other drastic editing on on this other than what you would do standard? Um, not really. I, I like quite a punchy look. Yeah. Um, so really, you know, it was a matter of just balancing off the interior against the exterior. Um, and then the other thing that had to be done because it's not like that in, as far as the location is concerned is I had to straighten the sidewalk. Hmm. So Mm -hmm. that's because of the way this is laid out, actually, um, the, the sort of the sidewalk is at an angle. Yeah. And it just didn't really work. Looked off, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know. So you, uh, you had to get these horizontal lines, and especially because we've got this yellow line on the tarmac as well. Yeah. Then the sidewalk, and then you've got the top edge. You've got the you know the full bore sign on the top. So it really had to all match. Um, it just you know. So, but again, that's super easily done. In fact, um, I did that in Lightroom. Oh, actually. really? Yeah. Um, so that worked exceptionally well. Absolutely no problem. Um, it didn't really get any perspective distortion or anything. Cool. It, was, it did a really good job. Um, yeah, and that was that was pretty much it. The other thing I always like to do, we did three shots, like, again, three setups, and I've hidden the band name in each one of the shots. I saw it on two of them. I don't recall it on the third one. Yeah. Oh, I'll, I'll show you on the third one. Yeah, I don't I don't recall. It. I don't know. I'm not sure why. Uh, let me see. Find the third shot again. Let's, uh... Ah, did not pick up on that. Nope. And we're not going to tell you where it is either. You're going to have to try and find it for yourself. <laughs> exactly. So, um, so yeah, it's the idea was really to keep all these things super subtle um, in this one. So, so yeah, so it was an interesting shoot. Um, it was really super fun. I, you know, personally, I just like those, mm. those kind of shoots. Um, and, uh, you know, it's also made me think that 
we should be doing a lot more environmental portraits like that and shoots like this <coughs> um, <Yeah. clears throat> in 2022. Absolutely. You know, um, especially when, you know, you have a really cool location, uh, you have some cool props, essentially, because that's yeah. what the motorbikes are, essentially, are props. The reason why this all went down um, like this and the reason why motorbikes are so heavily featured is because really three in a band are real motorcycle mm. yeah. fans, you know, yeah. and, um, and the motorbikes that you see in here, or especially the red Harley on the left and the, the triumph on the right are actually owned by, yeah. by those guys. So, so. you know, so th there's a, there's a big kind of biker connection in this, which made it mm. even more fun because everybody was really into the idea and, you know, and, uh, I think everybody came up with the goods really. Yeah. Wicked. It was, it was definitely. So I think, you know, our plan for 2022 is to find locations like this and, you know, well, put shots together. there's no excuse really is there because they are accessible and, you know, I think it's very rare. Take the, the, the owner of the shop here. It's quite rare for, to, to approach and say, look, we'd really like to do this on one of your days that you're shut. Yeah. They're not going to say no. They're very rarely going to say no well, because it's, it's great for them. They get a shop for their yeah. their shop as well. Yeah. I mean, let's say, you know, you'd be surprised how often people would say yes. Yeah. To something like that. So, That's it. you know, it's... And you it's, don't ask, you don't get. Yeah, it's just a, you know, I think it's about really coming up with the the creative brief. It's, it's, yeah, it's having a good concept for it. You know, and yeah. um, and then really just, you're trying to, trying to pull it all together. There were a lot of moving parts in this, actually, mm. uh, in terms of, like, availabilities and... Oh, that was a bit of a nightmare, wasn't it? You know, and timings and this and that. But in the end, you know, it really all came together. And maybe, perhaps surprisingly, we finished on time as well. Early. Well, yeah. Technically. Technically speaking, yeah, we finished early. We actually so. packed up and out by four. Yeah. Very so, good. Uh, so very, really very good. Bang on the money. Which was a we didn't want to overrun because it started getting dark then as well. Yeah, that would have uh, and yeah. that would have just made things just a little extra yeah. complex. But it was the reason why we had to finish at that time because half an hour later and it would have just, yeah. you know, the sun yeah. would have been gone. I mean, you know, that was one of the reasons why we <clears throat> started with the exterior shot. Yeah. You know. Um yeah. because had we had we had we flipped it on its head and, and done the exterior shot last, you know, with the sun changing or the light conditions changing so quickly at that time, around about that time, I mean, it would have just been a, night, a nightmare. Yeah, just, just, just not worth the hassle, is it? Literally every three minutes, you yeah. could like reset everything. It was, yeah. And and the thing is, right, it may have been okay if it would have been one shot, mm. but then trying to work out and fixing those issues that we need to fix and then having to do a composite, it never would have worked. Yeah, it would have, it would really, have looked too different. Yeah, it would have been tricky. So it would have um, taken too long to take the three different shots. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so planning. Planning two different shots. Yeah. Yeah, there we go. Wicked. So, yeah, interesting I, thing. I, hopefully I've put all of those shots up as we've been talking. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. We've got a little um, behind the scenes clip yeah. for well, you see, as well. This was the great thing about having an assistant uh, at the weekend was that I could actually focus a bit more on getting a bit, bit more BTS. Well, I mean, that was a part of the plan was that we would shoot behind the scenes footage. Yeah. Um, because the plan is that on the YouTube channel, camera, you know, youtube.com forward slash camera shake, of course, if you haven't checked it out, make sure you're there. Um, we'll, al we'll also put out more behind the scenes yeah. um, videos this year. So that's the other plan for 2022. Um, because we did that a few weeks ago, uh, I think between Christmas and New Year. Um, that was, you know, very well received. So we're going to continue doing that um, so we can, first of all, give you an insight into what we do, but also, you know, hopefully there'll be some learning opportunities exactly. in that whole thing Absolutely. as well. So, yeah, something to look forward uh, to this year. But so we, we had to shoot that. And of course, what that means is it immediately takes you out of the picture because you're busy doing that. And so then there's immediately a need for another assistant um, because, because you just need, I mean, th the biggest problem in this case, was that I was actually in the photo myself. So yep. you immediately need a trigger man or yeah. a woman, you know, a trigger person to pull the trigger. Was he on the grassy knoll? <laughs> Apparently. <laughs> hiding behind a fence. What is a grassy knoll anyway? What's a grassy, it's a grassy hill. Well, it's like yeah. an embankment, basically. Yeah. 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 Why, why was it called that back then? 
I think that's what it's actually called there. Oh, is that right? Like, that's, that's what it is. The, yeah, that's the actual location name mm. with the picket fence on the on the top mm-hmm. or something. Um, gotcha. Yeah. Where legend has it, another gun was found. Yeah. And gun smoke was seen or something. Of course it was. Which probably never happened. Anyway. Yeah, yeah. Um, but anyway, so, so yeah, so, um, you know, recording or, you know, filming. <laughs> Sorry, it's just reminded me of <laughs> so random. Did you, did you ever used to watch Red Dwarf? Uh, sometimes, yeah. There was an episode of Red Dwarf where they, they go back in time and they go back to that um, when he was shot. Oh, really? And they keep landing on different floors of the book depository. They knock the gunman out, and then so they have to, um, they let him take the shot, but then they work out that they need to be over somewhere else to make sure that it all happened. Right. But they actually had him shoot himself oh. from the crossing. <laughs> oh, no. it was, hey, I won't spoil it anymore. It's worth going to watch. Very funny. Very, very funny. Anyway, carry on. I was stuffing my face again. For real? How did we land? All right. We've only gotten through half of that. I know. Yeah. Got lunch to have and say. Exactly. So, um, yeah, so all in, I think it was a really successful shoot. It was super fun. Um, we'll definitely do more of that. Yeah. And I have a feeling there'll be more motorbike related um, content mm, to come as sure. well. Yeah, it's good fun. Very good fun. So the idea for this shoot is um, there's actually, we're shooting three different setups. So one is a wide setup, like a wide angle off the exterior of the shop, looking into the actual workshop. And so we've got some Harleys, and some Triumph, and a bunch of really cool motorcycles um, going around here. So we're gonna place all of that. Uh, we're gonna set up the interior a little bit. Uh, and after that, we're gonna go inside, go do another setup inside our workshop um, before we'll do just a you know, pretty regular kind of group portrait type of thing of the band um, indoors. That's it for now. The idea is we're fixing this bike. Right. The guys are waiting outside impatiently. We've got to fix this bike. So as we're doing this, we don't want to look at the camera, but we want to engage with each other. You know, you know when I press the shutter button because you hear the beep and you see the lights flash. Every time, every time the light goes, change one thing. Okay. So change your head. So if you change your head, don't change your hands. If you want to change your hand, don't change your head. Okay. Does right. that make sense? Just one thing at a time. Okay, here you go. Ready? It's the hardest thing in the world to do this, <laughs> I assure you. <laughs> Why do I hate you? Because you love it when I ask you to operate a pawn, right? <laughs> it's a pawn, bit. <laughs> Excellent. Let's go. Loving it. Okay, loving ready? It, loving it, loving it. This is the fun part that nobody ever tells you about, which is the loading and unloading. I've never seen you unload in your life. <laughs> okay, what are you doing? We've gone from low to a higher angle. That's what we're doing. <laughs> the sun is still Because uh, decisiveness is my strength. Every time. Yeah, that's cool. That's cool, perfect. Okay, bring your chin up. Okay, turn your head this way. That's it, cool, hold it exactly like that. I'm supposed to wear a patch on my good eye. A little 35 manual, picked out for nothing. Beautiful. 2.8 as well. You can use it? No, it works perfectly, man. It looks great. Really? I'm actually wondering whether I'm going to use that today. Do it. Yeah, so manual focus, sir. And we're going to be huddled around this bike. Right. And it's going to be like some musical bits strewn around somewhere. Um, but we, that means we're going to have to bring the lights to approximately probably here. Right. Um, I just need a little bit of space so we can move stuff around. So if we move this bike out, and we can probably move this back a little bit. Okay. I'm going to put this bit of corner off the end. I'm just going to bring this right up. <laughs> if I see a take that I like. Oh, you just going to note down the number. Okay. Can you take the plane? Malcolm in here. Malcolm needs to strip off, mate. Malcolm! Well, the whole idea basically is, you know, we don't really know what the hell's going on. All what we're doing, because we're like the seven forms. <laughs> so there's a lot of like... We're solving the problem, Mel. There's yeah. a problem. The problem right. is just there. Yeah. And go. Let's do one really nice one. And go. You got here, Mel? I love that. 
always wanted to be in a band. There you are now. I said, yeah. Down the lens, yes. Make sure we don't have any. So I hope you enjoyed that little behind the scenes snippet. Snippet, exactly. Snippet. Snippet. Um, okay, so what did you get for Christmas? What did I get for Christmas? Uh, I don't really remember. <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't that good? That's a Canadian whiskey, right? <laughs> yes, right. It was that good. That's right. I tried a little bit of that again last night. Funny. Oh, did you? I did. Yeah. Oh, right. I'm yeah. surprised you, you got any left. Yeah. Um, I'm tame with my whiskey. Are oh, you? Yeah. No, I remember no, I'm differently. I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've just bought myself a present. Okay. Actually, I bought myself a load of audio stuff recently. Um, right. Stuff to sell and all that. But um, uh, so because I got my new Mac for you. Um, yeah. a few weeks back or three or four weeks ago, whenever it was now. Um, I thought I should probably get myself a color checker calibrator. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I bought that. That's arriving today, funnily enough. Okay. Which one did you rather, get? Rather than having to borrow, borrow yours. Okay. Well, I should probably own one. Um, got the, so because I use X-Rite's um, video passport. Oh, yeah. Um, when we shoot, I figured I'll get an X-Rite. All right. The X-Rite color, check, cal- color checker calibrator. Right. Go on, try saying that fast. Can I take a clip, bread? <laughs> oh, man. Um, yeah, so we'll see. We'll okay. see what happens. I had to get the more expensive version because my Mac screen will go to like um, 1,500 nits. Right. And the regular version only goes up to 1,000. Right. But this will do a peak like 1,500 or something like that. So I thought I may as well future proof slightly. Yeah. And get yeah, a slightly more expensive one. Um, yeah, so we'll see because it's. I'm not. Because I used yours for a while on my previous Mac. Mm. I got really used to it. Yeah. And the color. Yeah. yeah. And I'm really noticing it on this <laughs> this screen now. Yeah. To the point where it's a bit of a problem. Yeah. It's amazing what you get used it's, to, isn't you it? You know, if you are not color calibrating your screen, you really should. Mm-hmm. But that's, that's all I can say. It's, it's a difference like day and night. And it's actually, you know made my life so much easier yeah 100 percent, 100 percent. color grading without it now is 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 trickier i remember the days like you know before before i calibrated my monitors and um or we used to um i used to do an edit and i would send it to my phone mm-hmm. and i know <clears> at the time that it would always display warmer on the phone than it does that did on my on my screen on my macbook screen at the time and so I always used to um edit everything slightly colder mm-hmm. you know and of course it's a pretty idiotic thing to do because if you just calibrate your screen it'll look pretty darn similar on all devices and this is exactly what's you know what, what happened was now i can rely on my screen i send you know i send uh, i send the image to my phone just as a check basically yeah and uh, and it really looks the same it looks identical this is, so. so i like i liken this to um mixing audio yeah right? correct. if mm-hmm. you mix in a room which is untreated that yeah. has no acoustic treatment whatsoever or you're not using some kind of software to flatten out your room because rooms are horrendous mm. they make everything sound bad that's just what they do mm. in certain areas and you know you might get a massive bass peak at 100 and then a massive trough uh, mm. like 300 and you just don't you everything just starts sounding hollow maybe or, mm. or really bass heavy or really harsh whatever it might be so unless you fix all of that you're on an absolute hiding to nothing no mm. matter what you do you can make it sound as good as you possible it will sound rubbish everywhere else mm. so you've got to fix that stuff first otherwise you're never going to you're this is why people give up mixing and go you know i can't do this it's because they're shooting themselves in their foot to, be, to begin with because mm. they're not fixing the problems, the environmental problems, let's say, no. um, before moving ahead. And they don't understand why is it not translating to the car or to headphones or that's why. It's not mm. that you're necessarily making bad decisions or doing something wrong. It's because your room is telling you something completely different to what's actually there. Mm. And that's not your fault. This is exactly the same. You can try and color grade a video or edit a photo on an uncalibrated screen and you're just scratching your head. Why is this not looking right 
yeah. everywhere else. <laughs> Why does it look different? Then you put it on Facebook and everything changes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So unless you, for the sake of, you know, the spider one is it is spider, isn't it? Mm-hmm. That's what a hundred quid. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, there's different versions and whatever, but, yeah. but, but you can get one for hundred quid, sure. hundred fifty mm. quid, two hundred quid, wherever it might. Mm. This, the one I got is two hundred quid, I think. Yeah. Um, all right, it might on the surface seem like a lot of money for something that you pretty much just do once or can just do once and then just periodically update it. But the money saved in terms of your sanity well, and getting things to look, it, things translating across devices is, that's priceless. Well, I mean, there's that, of course, but there's also, you know, the little fact that if you are working for clients, you need to be able to deliver something that you can guarantee looks exactly that on their screen looks, you know, as close to what you originally intended. Yeah. You know, and that's, that's just no other way yeah. that you can, that you can guarantee that. And, so. and that's the thing to remember as well. And you, you actually, you notice this more with video than you do with, mm. with, with, with photos, I think, um, because it's a, a moving image. And I think people, you know, there's something about it. You just notice it a little bit more is that, it will never look the same on two devices. Yeah. No matter what you do, it just will not look the same. It's going to look different. A video is going to look different on my Mac screen mm. to my external monitor, to my phone, to my TV, between browsers. You know, I don't even want to get started on that. You know where I notice that the most when it comes to um, portraits, for example, is headshots. Mm-hmm. Like especially anything that has a lot of skin tone in it. Right. I really, really noticed it. Yeah. Uh, you know, skin tone, actually, to be more specific, anything that has a lot of Caucasian skin tone mm-hmm. in it, um, I always find it really, really noticeable because you can immediately detect a slight green shift yeah. or when it's too warm or when it's too cold. You know, it, like that's that to me is the biggest tell, you know, telltale basically. Absolutely. Um, and, uh, and especially when it comes to headshots, I want to, make sure that the client, there are always slight differences between monitors and all the rest of it, you know, of course, Mm -hmm. but with, within, you know, within a certain range, you should be able to guarantee that, you know, what the client sees is actually what Mm -hmm. you intended in the, in the first instance, you know, and, uh, and it really, there's no other way to do that other than to, to calibrate your screen. So if you're not calibrating your screens, Go ahead and uh, and do that. And we're not yeah. sponsored by, spy, by no. a spider or anybody else. That's just, you know, a good piece of advice. But I will feedback on the x right one um, in due course as to yeah. how I find it. Cool. And where it's worth it. See, now that I'll actually have my own, I, I don't know if it has, because you know yours has that light meter on it as well, doesn't it? So you keep it connected. Yes, you can It will it. adjust it based on your ambient light it'll, as it yeah, changes, it'll, right? Yeah, and that works really well for me because um, where my, my editing station setup is, um, the lighting conditions change dramatically because, yeah. you know, due to day, I have a lot of daylight and, but I do like editing at night and I do like to turn some ambient lights on and stuff just to, you know, get the vibe. Yeah. Um, and it does, it does actually work quite well. Now, I got something interesting for Christmas. Let me guess. Um, Stollen? <laughs> well, had I known. No, I got this. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a it's an Instax, it's a Fujifilm Instax Mini 40 camera, and I've grown to love this thing. So, I love the feel of it. I love the look of it. I love um, the, the, what it produces. There is one thing I hate about it. What's that? And with a passion, hate. It's the viewfinder. <laughs> yeah, the viewfinder is because uh... I actually have, and you can take this how you will. I actually have quite long eyelashes. And unless I hold my eye open like that, I can. Ba- I basically can't see through your viewfinder. <laughs> it's, it's it's a really basic. Um, it looks great. It's a really basic instant camera. Um, it's interesting though. It's got the it's got the um, you know the retro vintage look going mm-hmm. for itself. Um, Fuji brought this out um, last year now in twenty twenty one, and uh, it's if you want to get into. Instax photography, it's like, you know, Polaroids, if you want to call that, um, then this is a really good yeah. way to, uh, to get to it. Yeah, it doesn't yeah, break yeah. the bank either. It's relatively uh, inexpensive and um, it's super awesome. It has literally no controls, which is the oh. other thing I love about it. It has one button that um, 
turns the whole thing on. And, uh, and it has the shutter button here. The flash always fires. Always, regardless. Mm -hmm. um, and the only the only other thing you can do is you can pull the lens out into selfie mode, and then you can take a selfie of yourself. And um, what's so, that doing to the lens at that point? It just changes the focusing. Uh, no, it changes the focusing distance. So it's it's basically it's a sixty okay, mil lens, fine. right? Um, obviously, there's no zoom or anything. Yeah, it's, sixty mil. Yeah, that would be. Yeah. So it's a sixty mil lens, um, which in since it's instant, so the equivalent in full frame would probably be roughly about 35, give or take, 34, 35 mil. Um, so it's it's a wide enough focal range you know, that will work <laughs> uh, for most things. Um, it has a little selfie mirror on the front. So you can actually, oh, once yeah. you pull this out, you know, you can look at yourself and then take a photo. Yeah. Which is, uh, which is very cool. So it's... Um, it takes about 90 seconds for that to to develop roughly. Just out of interest, how how much did that just cost you? Okay, well, so cost, that's... Let's talk about cost. Okay, so, I mean, you know, um, so you can get Instax films, especially Instax mini films in, in like, you know, in packs. So, you know, a film of two, so each film allows you to take 10 shots. Mm -hmm. um, a pack of two is roughly in the UK, it's about 14 pounds, 15 pounds. So it costs you about seven, seven pounds per film. So that's 70p, so 70 pence, 70 okay. pence um, you know, UK sterling. Um, oh, I'm glad you think I'm worth 70p. Oh. Very, very nice. So, uh, you know, I want you to put that by the side of your bed, please. <laughs> um, <laughs> the, the interesting thing about this, though, is you can get different packs of films. So like you can get a, a two pack and then a five pack and so on. But weirdly, um, I did a comparison and it turns out that whenever you buy a, a pack of two films, it's always going to work out cheaper than anything else. So if you buy a pack of five, it's actually more expensive per photo than, than it is to buy a pack of, of two. And the funny thing is you can get, you can get a pack, pack of, of two. As in two, two films. shots. No, two films. Oh, two films, two films. Yeah. yeah. So you can get a pack of four films, which is actually more expensive than two packs of two. That does not make any sense. So, you know. Just, they'll, they'll cotton onto that. Go bulk buy them. <laughs> Amazon, you know, if you're if you're listening, <laughs> you know, get multiple packs of two. That's the cheapest way. Um, so it'll be about seventy p roughly um, per shot. I, you know, one thing I think though is that it's it's possibly a mistake to think of it as a, an expensive way to take pictures. Um, I think you just. You just have to have some fun with it. Yeah. And we definitely, you know, as a, as a family, we had a lot of fun. I mean, one of the things that's really very rewarding is, um, you know, something I've done a lot with this over the last few weeks is that I've taken pictures. It's of, 10p towards it. Oh, thanks. <laughs> you know, I've taken pictures of other people and I've then given them the shot. Mm -hmm. And um, that's always, you know, got a really, really positive, warm reaction. Like, for instance, you know, I took, I took a picture of, um, of my stepdaughter with the dog. That's a really cute picture. You know, I gave it to her. She was that made her super happy. Yeah. Uh, same with you know my youngest daughter, um, and so on and so forth. And you know, um, my mom. It's a great thing. You know, when I when I brought my mom to the airport, um, you know, to say goodbye, we just took a quick selfie of the two of us together. You know, um, and I gave her that shot. You know, as a little, mm -hmm. you know, souvenir sort of thing. It's it's a really great thing for that. It's fantastic for that. Yeah, hundred percent. You know, and the it's so easy to use. I mean, it's ridiculously easy to use. You know, it's the Mini Forty is um, it's the same as the the Mini Eleven. Basically, the same technology. It's just a different body, okay. right? The Mini Eleven looks quite sort of plasticky. Looks a bit Pokemon. Mm. You know, um, this one is really exactly the same camera, but you know, no frills. Um, it's would you do like a, I think they do like a you know an extra case, like a vintage looking case that you can you get for that. This is all about the vintage look. Um, there really are no settings on it. You can't set anything. You can't, you know, change focus or uh, change exposure. It's really as, as simple as it gets. And the viewfinder is a really good example for that because this is the simplest of optical viewfinders you could possibly have in any camera because um, it really does nothing. Yeah, and it, <laughs> no. it's the size of, I mean, look, how big would you say that is that you got to look through? Yeah, it's very small. I mean, it's really small. <laughs> it's tiny. Um, 
you know, it's it's a quarter of a size of a regular camera yeah. viewfinder. Right? The film is, you know, couldn't be easier to load. It's basically um, a can cartridge. You get, can you get different film? As it, and what I mean by that is, oh. perhaps they've got different looks, or perhaps they've got uh, different styles on the surround. Yes. So yeah. So Fuji actually do um, a range of different ones. You can get black and white film for starters, mm -hmm. um, but you can also get different frames for it. Like you know, uh, so there's. There's a new film that looks really quite cool. It's like uh, it's a black frame with some yellow writing on it, like old contact sheets. Oh right, yeah. And uh, and so the frames are numbered as well. So you know the numbered one to ten. So you know it's not always the same the writing on it. So that looks that actually is pretty cool if you put them up mm -hmm. at home somewhere. Um, you know, no, I really like the idea of it. It's just a bit of bit of fun, you know. Yeah, it's the focusing distance on those is basically between thirty centimeters and infinity. Okay, you know. If you pull the um, the selfie lens out, it's basically between thirty and fifty centimeters where that focus is. And this is actually something I find difficult because my arms are too long for this. That's what I've noticed. Eight to fifty. Yeah. Yes. That's about from there to about there. So yes. for any, so you want to hold it a little, for, just shy of an arm's length, yeah. isn't it? For any Japanese person, this might <laughs> be fine. <laughs> Cut that if you're listening. I'm not cutting that. Shouldn't anyway. have said it. <laughs> so. You know, for any long armed person, um, I get better results just using the you know the, the regular lens rather than pulling it out uh, for selfies because obviously my arms are too long, my legs are too short. So I say, well, there yeah. you go. So um, cool, man. Yeah, it's and it doesn't break the bank. It's um, in the UK. This is sets you back about probably about ninety pounds. Oh, something like that. Yeah, really? Is that, is that cheap? I think maybe maybe I got it on a good deal or something. But um, oh, I'm gonna get one then. For that price, yeah, I, I I assume they were more in the sort of I don't know why in like the two fifty range or something like that. Not at all. No, they're about they were eighty quid, um, or ninety quid or something like that. Maybe came did it come with two films as well or something like that? Oh crap! Oh, I'm definitely going to yeah. get myself one. So it's really um, it's really interesting. And I'm going to come up with a way to make that viewfinder bigger. <laughs> well, Fuji are coming out with um, a brand new uh, Instax camera, by the way, uh, at some point later on this year, uh, called the uh, the Instax Evo. Which would be really an interesting thing to look out for. Do you know what the differences between the two are going to be? Yeah, so the Evo is basically going to be sort of a really hypercharged um, instant camera. What that's going to be able to, or allow you to do is uh, use it as a standard Instax camera, mm -hmm. but you can also use it as an Instax printer. Because at the moment, you can buy standalone Instax printers that take the same mini film, or they also do um, a square version of that because the different film formats yep. and obviously different cam you need different cameras So this one loads mini film which is this kind of portrait yep. um, format that's incidentally pretty much exactly the size of a credit card which is great because you can get these if you have a credit card holder like this you um oh you're one of those guys just fit the yes. pictures in it i actually just brought this because i had some some other examples of shots that i've that i've taken over the holidays um do you have any shots where you're not wearing a check shirt yeah this one <laughs> solo good lad <laughs> so um yeah so it is it's fun anyway the uh instax evo basically functions as a an instax camera and a printer which means you can i guess you print from your phone yes you can connect your phone via bluetooth to mm -hmm. the whole thing and you know um so that means you know you could um pre-edit your shots for example before you send it to print and stuff like that so it would be nice to see the I'd love to test that and see the take a photo, you know, with my phone. Wait, so can you transfer photos that you take on that to your phone, yes, edit you, them, and then print them back? Yeah, you could do that. Or you can, yeah, because it, it does normal. go both. So with the Evo, it does go both ways. It basically allows you to um, take a picture. It will print it out, of course, as it would do, but it will also then store a digital version of that, and you can send it to your phone, and then you could edit it. And then send it back and print it again. You could do that, or you could just take a photo on your phone and then send it to the camera to print. I'd love to see the different how they the, the, the look differences when mm. you do that because I'm most of the look comes from taking the photo on that yeah. camera, right? Um, as well, so it will have its own look. Yeah. So, so I if mean, you could take the photo on that, yeah. it not print, right? Which I'm I'm wondering it might be possible. We'll see. Um, and then transfer it to phone. Do any yeah. edits that you want to do. I think that, but at the same time, man, you can the give whole it, purpose. Well, that's that's exactly what I was going to say. I mean, the the whole purpose of this is 
is not really to edit anything. It's, no. The whole point is is that it that it's instant. Yeah. You know, the whole beauty it, of it is. It's one thing if you really want to, yeah, you, know, you love the shot or whatever, but you just want to edit a horrible spot that you've got out or something like that. I don't know. You know that yeah. might, but otherwise, that's kind of yeah. They are what they are. I mean, you know, if you use the digital imagery, I mean, these are oh. not. I mean, they're not in terms of sharpness. They're not anywhere near. I said they're soft. <laughs> yeah, they're very soft. But you know, it's um, it's film. Yeah, you know, it's instant film. What do you expect? I tell you what, I do like. I strive to get that in, in video. Mm. I tell you what, I do like about our Fuji's Instax line um, compared to Polaroid is that you know the thing that's always annoyed me with Polaroids is that although I quite like the square format. Polaroid film has always had this magenta kind of tone to it, you know, mm. and and I've never really loved that, you know, and I like the Fuji colors better. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they, they have more of a yellow green um, hint, yeah, to them, don't they? Yeah, they definitely come out better, and that's you know, right. um, I find it really with with all of them. I just that is more pleasing which is a, a better a better side to be mm. in this in this scenario anyway yeah. because it's you know if you if you think of just think of movies right more often not a little a tiny little green gets added mm. in they'll go on the side of green yeah. and then yeah, magenta you know the thing the thing about the magenta thing in polaroids is that that's the polaroid look it's more cinematic you know yeah, and if that's yeah. you know if that's the kind of thing you dig then then great um i prefer this format as well than the polaroids if i'm if i'm honest so Fuji do a square format, mm. um, which is, I think it's the SQ1 um, or SQ6, I can't remember, but there's a different line of cameras that basically um, shoot square film. The square film is a little bit more expensive. It's about a pound to two pounds more expensive uh, per per film. So you're probably adding about 10 pence on mm. per, per shot. Because it's slightly okay. larger. Because it's larger, yeah. yeah. Um, and also they don't do as many options. I think for the square film, it's, I think they just do one option. Maybe to do, I'm not even sure whether they do a black and white version for that. Okay. But it's, it's a lot more limited. Uh, they're really pushing this, a mini format. Yeah, yeah. You know. It's cool, man. And, um, and it works, yeah, it works well. So. I'll take a little look around. I might get one. We'll have to go do a little, little challenge between ourselves if we get oh, one. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. that will be so, good fun. So the, uh, you know, the Insects mini films, they look a little bit like this. It's basically a cartridge. There's obviously an empty cartridge. But um, it loads within a second. Um, it's super easy. Sweet. You know, and um, I highly recommend it. If you want to have a little bit of fun. Remember, this really isn't a thing where you think of it in terms of like, oh, you know, I can't take a picture because I only have three pictures left, mm. or three shots left on this film. It's more like you have to actually go out there and, and use the thing because mm -hmm. that's where the enjoyment lies. You know, um, I've gone through several films by now. And I'm really super happy. And, I, and to be honest, I haven't fluffed up that many shots. So there was one where I was taking a picture of, of the dog and he was like perfectly still. And then of course, the moment I hit the shutter button, he was jumping up. So all I've got is mm. a leg <laughs> in the shot. Yeah. So that was, you know, money That's down it. the drain. That's it. But you know, just don't feed the dog for a day and get exactly. the money back. <laughs> <laughs> Only kidding. And on that terrible disappointment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no dogs were harmed in the making of this episode. Anyway, so... That is and was the uh, Instax Mini 40. We love this camera. Um, if you want to get into uh, Instax film or you know instant uh, film kind of photography, it's a really great way to start. Um, other cameras are available, of course. We're in no way sponsored by Fujifilm, but we love them. Indeed. And on that bombshell, that's it. We've come to the end of episode 90. And again, I say again, 90. 90 episodes. Almost your age. Almost my age. And only 10 away from the biggest party we were going to have. <laughs> 10 weeks time? Mm. <laughs> yeah, not sure about that. But anyway. Um, so and remember, if you are listening to the audio version of this podcast, please leave us a review. That'd be super awesome. Give us a little star rating. That would help us a lot. Um, and if you want to not only listen to our sultry voices on here, but um, see our pretty faces in full technicolor make sure you head over to youtube.com forward slash camera shake and uh, once you're there why don't you just hit the uh 
the like button, you know, click the bell, um, subscribe, and all the rest of it. That'd be super awesome. But that being said, we shall see you again next week. Thank you.